Okay, the first step in being able to model the, uh, the beam and being wrapped around the mandrel of the spring back is to create the geometry. And I'm simply going to create a, um, a line or beam. So I'll make a line and then we'll create a profile and turn that into a beam uh, with the appropriate cross section. Uh, and you can choose the length is somewhat flexible. It's going to, uh, depending on the length and the angle, determine the radius that you bend it to. And so you'll just need to do some calculations, but you could choose some values. Though I would suggest that you want to keep it to less than 360 degrees of rotation uh, to avoid uh, complications in order to, and that'll be sufficient to simplify, to approximate what we want to do here. Okay, so here we are. We've got our geometry in there. And now the mesh is pretty straightforward with the beams. So let's go ahead and set up our, our structural analysis. Um, first off, before we do anything else, I want to make sure we remember to use large deflections. And now let's set up our boundary conditions. So let's fix one side. And fix that. And then we're going to do a different uh, displacement here. Let's go ahead and put a uh, we'll do a remote displacement. Um, this we haven't used before, but it allows you to apply rotations as well as displacements. Uh, for this application, we're just going to go ahead and select the right side of the beam. And you can see that it gives us a chance to select both the X, well that's a position information, we can set these displacements. And to keep this in the plane, you can see that this is drawn in the XY plane. So I'm going to set my Z displacements to zero. And we will make our X and Y rotations equal to zero. Now this will help stabilize it just a bit. And then we will apply rotations in the Z. Now, so I'll just start by putting 10 degrees in there. Actually, I want it to be a negative 10. But we're going to want to ramp this. And so let's go to the analysis setting. We're going to change the steady. Now, oh, maybe we'll say 10. Um, so if we come back to remote displacement, now we can go ahead, minus 20, minus 30, minus 40, minus 50. Actually, I could just get down here and just say, and you can see it'll interpolate it between these. And this last one, I'm going to right click on it and hit activate, deactivate. And you notice everything's grayed out. That means it won't actually uh, apply any displacement criteria there. So in fact, what will happen will be as though you're bending and applying an angle and then you let go. And so that's the point that step 10, in this case, the one that's deactivated would be allow us to get, find our spring back. Okay, so I also need to come back here and make sure that I have the right geometry applied. Um, so it says structural steel, so let's change that to our aluminum that has the uh, plastic analysis in there. But sometimes it may be good to go ahead and run an elastic analysis to debug it, uh, since that's a little easier to do. There's some kinds of, of errors that you won't see with elastic plastic, uh, with with just the elastic analysis. And so it may be a good debugging step. Okay, so let's go ahead and hit solve and see how we're doing. Okay, so we've run the analysis. I didn't put any initial conditions in there. Let's go ahead and, and create a uh, directional displacement. We'll pick X axis and we'll change the other one to Y axis. And to help update those, there's a nice feature here. We can say rename based on definition. It'll automatically update that. Uh, then it's also very helpful, particularly in this case, to be able to look at stress states. Now, it's not giving me any stress information because I didn't have it output my, uh, didn't have it set up to save my beam results. I need to do beam section results. Yes. And now I could add a, equivalent stress, a VC stress, and let's go ahead and evaluate all results. Okay, so we can see, in fact, we've got extra deflection, wide deflection, equivalent stress, 
And if I want to see the position at different points, we could see that here at load step nine was when it was at its peak angle. So let's retrieve that result. And you notice how it's bent farther. And let's, let's actually plot the stress on that. So let's retrieve result. Okay, so this is kind of what you'd expect. If you notice the stresses, everything in red um, is plastically deformed. And so you see plastic deformation top and bottom, elastic uh, in the middle. And then if we go to the, uh, the last state after it's after it has uh, unloaded, so let's retrieve that result. You notice that there's still some stress there, and that's related to the residual stress of the outside's uh, edges. And what you'd find is that this tinsel side, that's actually a compressive residual, and we'll have a tinsel residual on the other side. And But uh, it's pretty st still pretty substantial. It's 155 uh, KSI in this case. So that amount of that will depend on how far it has been strained. Okay, so that's the basics of doing the analysis. Uh, we could see, for example, we could animate this and you could see it curving there. Okay. And, and you could change your apps, your your maximum value depending on what you want to uh, what you want to see. Um, right. So that's the basics of doing a plasticity analysis. Uh, there are other ways it could be done. We're taking advantage of the fact that this is a circular radius, so we could get that with a constant moment. Um, and we're also taking advantage of the beam elements, which are easier to handle for these larger displacements than what a, uh, uh, what a solid mesh would be. So it does get a lot more complicated this, but you can begin to see some of the effects using this simple approach as well as some of the procedures.